Welcome, welcome back to Convos with Kozell. I'm your host, James Kozell, your favorite non-guru. I have my mentor here, bro. This is crazy, bro. I got Mr. Kareem Ty. I've known this man since I was 18, going on 19. Now I'm 30 and a grown-ass man, okay? So for Kareem, for the people that don't know you, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first, you made me feel old when you said 18, and I'm thinking about how old I am right now, so... Yeah, my name is Kareem. Uh, born and raised in Cincinnati. They call it the Natty. Been doing this for a while. Um, one thing I thought about, you know, I, I I went through the whole Cincinnati public school system. I was a part of the Young Scholars Program, which you know, James. Um, part of a blended fam- family of five. And yeah, I attended Ohio State, the Ohio State University. Come on. Trademark. Heads off. Yeah. Um, and shoot, a long list of things. I feel like I've been a plumber. I've been a janitor. You know, I've been a part-time, you know, part-time uh, car dealer. I've got it all, man. <laughs> for sure, for sure. A man of many talents. And we're going to talk about that blended family as well. Uh, let me ask you so, because I, I do know that you're married, and this is our relationship series here. Did you meet your wife at, at the Ohio State University? No, no, we had a, we actually had a, it was kind of a sombering meet. And I'm, I say that because we, uh, both my grandmother and her father died the same year we met. Oh. And so I was actually um, about to do a step show. So shout out to the bros. That's how we yeah. do it. But I was about to do a step show and her friend invited her to come out to a step show. And so it was through a mutual friend that we met and I can remember um, me seeing her right after the show, I had to drive straight down to Cincinnati. I got the news that my grandmother passed. And so Mm -hmm. I finished the show and I got right in the car. Actually, I saw her and just introductions. And then I got in the car and went to Cincinnati. Um, A week later, I came back and um, through a mutual friend, uh, I was like, well, give her my number. She said, no, give him my number. Have him call me. And so that was okay. pretty straight up. So I called her mm-hmm. and I can remember we talked for a full hour. I mean, a full wow. hour. And I think most of that hour she talked. She was actually frying some chicken. I, I, I remember that. <laughs> and um, Just talking about her goals and what she wanted to become. And, you know, I, and I'm not, you know, better to say this. You know, my wife, she didn't even have her, her high school diploma. Mm-hmm. when I met her. So she was talking about getting her GED, getting her degree. I mean, just listening to her. And I was like, that's what's up, man. That's what's up. And then it kind of grew from there. And so that's when I found out her dad passed the same year. He got in a really bad car accident and just never recovered. And so oh, wow. I think we, we kind of came together on those two fronts. Okay. And, and you guys are married now, right? Yeah, yeah. No, last time I checked, man. Last time. I- <laughs> <laughs> that you know, right? <laughs> so it'll be it'll be going on thirteen years. Wow. Uh, Mary, um, like I said, blended family, and so it comes with its trials and tribulations. But um, yeah, yeah, we're we're still married, still going strong. Okay, and how many years again? It'd be thirteen years. Okay, so what do you? Because th- that's a long time. Matter of fact, that's long. That's a long time. So tell me, yeah. what do you? Think, what do you think it is that's kind of like kept you guys together for so long? Because I know it's tough. You know, people say this all the time, and I think it's cliche. Communication is important. And not just communicating, understanding. Because I can talk to her all day long, but she don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Right. And so we had to work on that. So when we, we first got married, of course, come together. You know, I had two kids. She already had two. We already had four. We had one together. Um, we had to get that whole thing together. What does all that look like? Um, and how do we communicate with the children? How do we have a united front? And how do we parent these kids? Of course, you know, her children, different father, you know, so that was a different way of disciplining the kids and the same for me. And so, it took a number of years for us to kind of figure it all that out. Like, what does that really look like? And, you know, how are we going to make this work? And then, uh, you know, our situation, you know, how do you grow a marriage, you know, through that? And then how do you grow a family? And so 
I think the key for us is we had to really understand each other's struggles. I think one of the biggest pieces about us is that we struggle together. I can I can remember I actually I, I used to work at the bank. I worked at the bank for a number of years. I got so burned out, and one day I got up and I said I quit, and I quit mm-hmm. my job. I quit my job. That same week, I said this is funny how we got together. That same week. My wife quit her job. Wow. Same week. And so we both got together and we got married and we didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I was working a I was working a temp job. I was working a temp uh, job and making maybe twelve dollars an hour. I think she ended up getting an internship somewhere, making next to nothing. And I and I look back on that, I'm like, how in the hell do we make that work? And I'm gonna tell you, man, every time I saw her from the moment we said that we were gonna get married, it didn't feel like a struggle. When love is there, it, don't feel, it didn't feel like a struggle. So I think once when we when we get through those struggling moments, we go back to when we started, where we started. And it's a beautiful thing for us. So we always rehash where we've been and then where we're going. And, and talking to each other, you know, just sitting down and, and just having a conversation. That's my best friend. I can honestly say that's my best friend. That's dope. That's dope. So a lot of a lot of conversations that I've been happening or that I've been having with um, couples that have been married for quite a while, both of the men, they both said like, hey, man, when you know, you know, and that's the most cliche phrase of all time. You know what I'm saying? And it kind of your situation kind of sounds exactly the same you know what i'm saying what is it that triggers you like you like you know what this one ain't going nowhere when you're having a conversation when you know you know you're having a conversation with them and let's take out outside of a relationship like we had a we had a really good friendship and i think that's where it starts outside of the attraction of course my wife is very beautiful i'm yeah. not saying to say that but outside of that i felt i could it was never a forced conversation. It felt like we were meant to talk to each other. We were meant like I felt she understood me. You know, when you 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 talking to someone, you like you know what she gets me. Yeah, she get yeah. where I'm coming from. I mean, this is just conversation. Like you understand where I'm coming from. We don't judge each other because you get a situation where you feel like people are judgy. She didn't judge. I come I come with a lot of mistakes. I am not perfect. And you come to someone and you say, hey, look, I made these mistakes. This is where I am. And she was like, you know what? I don't care about that. Let's go in this together. And your actions is is a big deal. So I felt like after that and then, you know, just being around her, even outside of us just getting married, like taking a walk with her and we just talk about anything. Mm-hmm. You can just talk all day. That's a good friendship. And so... You know, I consider to this day, I mean, we do the same thing. You know, we don't break, break habit. If I really feel I'm feeling something, she gives me the time to let me be me. Mm. And we let each other be each other. And I, I think that that helps a lot because, you know, people get in marriages and I, I've heard and I've seen it where you try to be something that you're not. Yeah. You can't be something that you're not because pretty soon that's going to wear off and your true self is going to eventually come out. And so me coming in as my true self, all the mistakes that I've made in the past, all the judging that I've gotten, she still come to me and she treats me like the best thing since the Cadillac. I don't know. She treats me like the best thing in the world. And it feels good to feel to be treated that way. So, yeah. So, so you did mention where you you had to and she had to and y'all kind of Brady bunched it, okay? Yeah. Now, so explain that, unpack that for me. So, like I said, she already had two. I had two. First thing is you got to break that to your kids. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, you're gonna be going to a union. I'm, you know, I'll be stepfather. She be stepmother. Um, I felt it was tough in the beginning. The reason why it's tough because you're dealing with a, a biological father. You're dealing with biological mothers, and the dynamic is is so important. And so, you know, it may be bad relationships or bad blood. And so, we we had a lot of struggle uh, throughout. And you know, I'll be honest. I mean, we went. We had to go through 
uh, court proceedings because we had to do shared parent agreements. I mean, we we went through pretty much hell, you know, uh, throughout that. But I think one thing that kept me positive is we we held hands through the whole thing. And so what was what was kind of um, kind of a sad time because going through, I mean, I went to court on my side. She was going to court. We were doing it like for two years only to be able to get our kids together and so and be able to have time with them. And so you deal with that dynamic. Then you also got to deal with, you know, us two in a marriage, you know, we're working through all that. So on top of all that, then, you know, her mom, my mother-in-law, the first year we got married, she moved in with us. Mm. So, yeah. So she called her, was like, yeah, um, I'm going to need y'all to come pick me up. And so I'm I'm like, who are we picking up? (laughs) So that's a funny story. So you know, she called and she was like, yeah, I mean, my mom will move in. Maybe they probably had a conversation before, but it didn't matter for, to me. So picked her up, went there on a Saturday, called up one of the girls like, look, I'm going to need help. So I'll be there first thing in the morning. And mm-hmm. that's, that's what I've been my dude since day one. Got there in the morning. This woman ain't had nothing packed. She was sitting there with the food. It was like 6.30 in the morning. I'm like, I thought we were supposed to come pick you up and move. She was like, yeah, you can start. So uh, we had to box up the stuff. <laughs> we had to box up the stuff, you know, and move around. But I love her to death, um, you know, and just having a family. I think the biggest thing for us, because, of course, our fifth child is a child we had together. Yeah. Uh, Jackson. Um, he get to be around his grandmother. He get to see that dynamic and, you know, it's it's been a beautiful thing just to just to see that interaction, you know, even with his his brother and sister, you know, it just it's it's been great, but it took a long time to get that together because you got to deal with trust issues. Yes. You know, does my does my children trust my wife? Yeah. Does her children trust me as a father? Can they, you know? And it, I don't tell you, it's, it it was it was tough, but you know, we relied on God, and I'll even take you back a little further because. I grew up in a Baptist church, you know, in Cincinnati. And then I just saw a lot of hypocrisy. And when I became a teenager, I left the church. I was yeah. done with the church. Yeah. So I got to college, came here to Columbus. And, um, you know, everybody going to New Salem, New Birth. You know, I think it was all the black churches so yeah. in the church. But I was not a believer. I was done with it. And so one thing she asked me when I met her is, you know, do I believe in God? And I said, you know, I do. But. You know, my destiny is my destiny. Everything's controlled by me. I started having that type of conversation. And I was always surprised that she just held on to me because I I was up front with her. I was not a believer. And she brought me back to the church. Mm. She brought me back to church. Um, I ended up getting baptized. Uh, the following year we got married, uh, we, were, we found a home church. And we just had a different outlook on things. So God led everything we were doing. I felt that we didn't have that in our life um who knows where our marriage would have been so you know the fact that she believed um in god and she stayed with me i mean it was it it was beautiful because i know sometimes she was like i'm ready to leave this guy because he's reasonable (laughs) but you know and so i get credit where credit is due and and the fact that we were able to stay together and, and let god lead um through our trials and tribulation, it, it was definitely a great thing for us. For sure, for sure. So a two, two-fold question here. Yeah. What would you say was the most difficult part of you guys joining families together for you and Sam? And then what would you say was the most difficult part for, for the children? So for those who don't know, my wife is, is Asian. She's Cambodian. Mm-hmm. And so that whole dynamic um and getting my family to understand it it wasn't tough but it was weird not on our end but on everybody else's end and then two the fact that i already had children and it's it always come to conversation well why didn't you marry them you get that conversation so it was a lot of judgment i felt i was i was fighting a battle that i shouldn't have had to fight but you know it was i I started to realize, I started to figure out how to define friendship mm-hmm. with people that was around me and the people that stuck around me, they were upfront with me, they were honest with me, but they were, they were friends that 
stuck through it. But I had a lot of people that were against it because they really didn't understand it. They didn't understand like, well, how the hell are you just going to marry this woman? Where did she come from? Yeah. It wasn't forced. I mean, this was a natural thing between her and I. And I'm a person, I, you know, I, I don't care what you think about me. I really don't. You don't. Yeah, you don't. My life. You know how, you know how I do it. And so, you know, it, those first two years was really tough. So we got a lot of judgment. We got a lot of people that came to us and said, you know, you know, it's a shame. You know, I don't believe, I can't believe, or oh, you know what, this won't last because he's wow. unstable. You unstable. I mean, we got a lot. I and mean, we had a lot of her friends that walked away from her because one, they didn't think I was good enough. But then here we go, 13 years later. And so, you know, I think without her having God and then even re reintroducing him to my life, I don't think it, this would have last. I mean, it was a lot. Now, as it relates to our kids, the the really tough part is because her kids were, you know, of course, we moved in together. Her kids were there. I had to make arrangements for my kids. Of course, you know, my son was in Cincinnati. I was constantly every week having to pick them up. It was um, not so good communication. So it'll be some weeks. You're on a good week. She'll come meet me some week. I'm going to go silent, so I'm going to have him sit there at the outlet mall until he figures out I'm not coming. You know, I had to deal with that. So it was just a lot of things. But one thing I would say is her and I had to continue to be positive about it because we couldn't bring the negative energy around the kids. Because mm. negative energy plus negative energy, you know, it, it, it breeds for a bad relationship. And so I yeah. wanted to make sure we stayed positive. Our first five years... We took the kids together on trips. We kept them together. I mean, we traveled quite a bit just because we wanted the, them to, you know, just be around each other, get to know each other. And even to this day, I mean, they all still talk to each other. I mean, it's still a good relationship. And so that I love um, because I was worried about that. You, you worry that, you know, you get kids together and it just doesn't work out. But shoot, they are your kids. So how are you mm -hmm. going to make that work? And so, uh, man, it took a lot of prayer. It really took a lot of prayer. And, Sometimes it didn't work out, you know, for us. Sometimes it did. You know, my, my, my son now, biological son, he's in the uh, military, mm -hmm. you know, overseas. And, you know, being able to talk to him, you know, sporadically. But, you know, it's now they're adults now. It's talking yeah. to them as an adult. It's a different type of conversation. So um, I feel like it's an ongoing thing. But I make sure that they got my full attention, especially when I'm talking to them especially when we're spending time together is they, I want them to always feel that I can always be there for them. So, so, so when you, when you, when you speak on, cause first of all, Sam is amazing and we can all attest to that. Um, with her being of a, a different ethnicity, was it more so friends or family members that was like, Kareem, like what's going on? And then was it, was it tough to adjust um, with two different cultures being in the home, blending that together for the children? Um, kind of, because it was, you know, of course, the food is different. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and the culture and the discipline is a little different. But I think the, the great thing about living in Columbus, because Columbus is so diverse, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of interracial marriages, is we just we felt accepting being here. I can remember a time we took a trip to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we took a trip to Tennessee. I think we went to Gatlinburg. Nice. And we went to a grocery store. And we walked in there and it felt like everybody just dropped their grocery bag and they just stood, stared at us. And we oh. weren't used to that. We weren't used to that. I was like, well, what are they staring at us for? She was like, I don't know. And it kind of like settled in. I was like, well, maybe. I was like, oh, because I'm black. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, that's the first thing you think about. Yeah. And then it was an older lady that came to us and said, are you two together? And I mm. said, yes. She was like, I don't see that. That's a beautiful thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. She was like, that's a beautiful thing. And so, because she was staring at us, staring at us the whole time. And so, you know, you, anywhere we go, we went to Alabama uh, earlier this year, you know, we got some looks, but, you know, being here in Columbus, I mean, I think it helps because we love the environment. We love the fact that, you know, everything is pretty diverse here and we, we feel comfortable here. And so it worked out, but it took, it took a number of years for our families to kind of mesh in terms of cultures you know, me being able to, you know, I took my wife to a family reunion. You know, everybody was like, well, you know, yes. males. I'm like, come on, look, you know, the whole cliche thing. 
So, you know, I had to deal with that. But one thing I would say, my family was very inviting. You know, we all have our jokes because that's how we do it. You know, jokes, hey, would you do some nails or do you do hair? And you do all that. But, you know, for example, my mom, you know, once you see how much I support and how much I'm loved, it's all good. Yeah. And so I think we're probably one of the very few cultures that, you know, will accept anything and everything as long as you do right by us. And that's what happened. And so, you know, we go to our family reunion every year. She has, you know, my cousins, everybody, they love her, you know, everybody talking. It's just great to see that. So, you know, nice. in nice. terms of her family, um, of course, her, her dad, he passed. You have her mom. Um, you know, she moved here. Actually, she moved to the States when she was eight years old. She was in the West Coast and she moved here to Columbus at a young age. So all of her family is in Cambodia. Cambodia. Uh, she has two sisters. Um, mm -hmm. one in California and actually one lives here. So, you know, it's a, she has very few family. And so us coming together, she felt she had, her family was complete, you know, when we got married. So it, it, it was, it was a lot. It, it was just really a lot of just building relationships, especially building relationships with her sisters, um, her building relationships with my family and then making sure that the kids felt comfortable enough to be open and, and really talk about how they really feeling. Cause we've had some bad conversations If they weren't feeling nothing. I want them to tell me that. And yeah. so, you know, I have to be humble, humble enough and have enough humility to say, Hey, you know what? This is wrong. I understand that. And how can we make it better? And those are tough conversations to have, especially when, you know, you don't get to see your kids every day. I mean, it's tough. True. True. Now, now I'm, I'm going to ask this question and it might be, controversial due to the times that we're living in but yeah whatever is there a difference in between how um you know he says she's asian and cambodian treats you as opposed to how a woman of a, a different ethnicity like that relationship is there like a difference like a big difference like oh well she's a little bit more nurturing than this type of woman or anything like that no, I, I wouldn't say not. I mean, my wife, she is very, uh, she's a very nurturing person. Mm -hmm. like, like how it does, she cooks probably almost every day. She and cook. she can cook too, man. Yeah, you can cook, you've had the food. So, I mean, she's a very nurturing person. She's very Americanized. I mean, she's mm -hmm. been here for quite a while. And so I would say on the other side of it, because of her culture, um, I would say um, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to show emotion. Gotcha. With her culture, you know, and I see it more in her mom is because her mom is like she don't believe in sarcasm or us making a joke because she don't she don't understand that. Gotcha. So they're, they're you know it's a pretty strict culture, and so sometimes that emotion, you know, can be be a struggle. And so when we we got married, I mean it's. Either we're going to do this or we're not. There's never an in-between with her. And so, you know, sometimes we will get, you know, an argument and it's like, is this it? Yeah. You know, because, you know, just the emotion piece, they, they can't handle it. And so, you know, I think we both taught each other something because I'm very expressive. Me, I want to yeah. talk and say, look, I'm good. Give me two days and then I may come back to you. <laughs> so <laughs> we got to do that. But then we have to understand that probably wasn't conducive to our marriage. Nor is me saying I need to talk right now while everything is heated. So how right. do we find that balance? And so I think trust was big for us that we had to learn to trust each other enough that I know she wouldn't hurt me. I know that we need to handle an issue. But one, I'm not going to force her. Two, mm -hmm. I trust that she we will eventually talk about it. And so that took a number of years to I kind of understand that dynamic between between each other. I got you. So what what do you think? Um, so for from I mean, you're only a couple years older than me. Um, why do you think like our generation now doesn't really want to get married? I think it got a lot to do with technology and social media, what they see, you know, and, and you see all the bad. I mean, I, I remember looking at a, a TikTok video about the guy coming in and he only uh, feeding his kid and then the other kids <laughs> are free. like, I, you know, I think I think the public depicts marriage in a, a negative way. Mm. And we don't have 
social media or any any type of platform that's depicting marriage in a positive way you know because and then you know if you're looking at TikTok all day and you're swiping through or you're looking at snapchat or you're going through your facebook account is nothing but bad situations or somebody upset about something and that's just media in general and so when you feed into that and then not having a structure so when i when i grew up i'll give you a story so when i grew up i have uh four aunts one uncle my mm-hmm. mom is a, a paternal she's a twin she has a twin brother that's my okay. uncle. none of them were married so i've never seen marriage i don't mm-hmm. know what look like i've seen boyfriends i've seen girlfriends you know and we kind of grew up through that now my uncle he's been with the same woman for 30 years they just got married about 10 years ago and you know but i that's my aunt but i've never seen what a what a what a kind of two-parent household would look like it was all single parent households you know we got baby daddy over here or you know that's that's my father so my father he passed in 1998 i was already one year in college but if you ask me like hey what was your dad like man i couldn't even remember i couldn't remember what he even looked like you know and when he passed that year, you know, I came home and I saw a picture of him and I was like, man, that looked just like me. But yeah. what, what sad me is the fact that I didn't know him. I didn't know his family. Yeah. And them talking to me, they felt like strangers. I had mm. brothers that I've never met before. Mm. And so growing up in that environment and growing up through that, I, I was like, well, what did, why would I ever get married? Like that yeah. doesn't make sense. I'm used to this setup. So let me go ahead and just do me. I'll give me a girlfriend here and there. We do what we need to do. Bam. That's it. And so me getting married, honestly, that was like a big step for me because one, I'm like, that that's not gonna work out because I've never seen it. And then my aunts never got married. So in my head, I'm thinking, well, if they never got married, maybe marriage is not the best way to go. Yeah. You come up with our own assumptions based on our environment. And so I saw that. And I never even fathom of, of getting married. But I think now with, with this younger generation, they see the bad in marriage. They never see the good. We never publicize with, with things that are going well mm-hmm. in our society. We were quick to jump at, you know, the, the what was that called? The crate challenge. I mean, all, all the stuff that's funny, yeah. and all the things that are bad. And so, you know, I had to stop watching the news or even try to teach my, my younger son because, you know, he's. He has a phone and he goes through that stuff. And so trying to separate the good from the bad is a hard thing. It's, it's a tough thing to do. Damn. Damn. So if you, cause you, you mentioned that you, you had, you didn't see marriage before. So if you had no blueprint, like where do you kind of get all your ideas and kind of like your experience from to, you know, equip you to have such a long lasting marriage in the first place? You need a and support to- group. Yeah, you need a support group. So, of course, again, of course, we're in the church. Yep. I'm, a part of a, I'm a part of a men's group. Um, and, I mean, we, we talk a lot. All of us are married. And um, just being vulnerable to other people, I think the, the worst thing is, and even as black men, we scared to open up to people. We're really scared. And yes. I think that, I mean, I grew up, I was like, I grew up, I got to be hard. And yeah. if people don't know a hard beat, to be tough. You know, you can't even see my team. You got to, you know, you see the, yeah. is it, it's about to jump off if you say something <laughs> wrong. And so we had to grow up to be that tough person. You can't, didn't have to show emotion because if you showed emotion, you show weakness, you, weak. Weak, you might get your ass kicked. So that, that's just it. But we grew up, I grew up in that environment. And so being around other men, being able to open up and being, you know, just being vulnerable, I think paints a different perspective on marriage because I, I mean, I hear problems. I mean, we meet probably once or twice a month and we talk about our problems, but we also talk about, you know, you know, what can we do to be better? And of course we refer mm-hmm. to scripture, but you know, let's be realistic, you know? And so I, I think having a support system is important. I don't think anybody can do their marriage alone. You need God and you need a, and you need a good community of just good people around you. Because um, I have a friend, he's married. Mm-hmm. He lives in Cleveland, he's married. All of his friends are single. Mm. And so we talk. And he was like, Yeah, you know, I'm going to go, you know, go to this party. You know, my friend introduced me to this this friend. I'm like, Who's his friend? And he said the girl's name. I was like, well, 
what are you doing? He was like, oh, man, but you, you're getting bad advice. You get mm-hmm. advice from somebody that, that's not walking in your shoes. I'm not telling you not to have single friends because I got friends that are single. You know, you're not married, right? So, you know, I got friends, so I got friends that are single, but you got to discern whether or not it's good, it's good advice or it's not, it's, it's interfering with your spirit. And so mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I tell them that time and time again, I'm like, you got to really discern whether or not you're around the right people or you're going to be calling me, telling me that you're about to file, right about to file divorce papers. Yep. So I think the people around you is, is very important. And you being able to, you know, being able to discern whether or not it's a good idea or it's just not a bad idea. It's not. A, it's a bad idea. So, so with the with the opening up piece, um, it is it's not easy opening up to people, especially a, a group of strangers, and they and they eventually become friends. But at first, they're strangers, you know. Right. And and what what was the what was that moment that you were like, you know what? It's probably okay if I can open up to these people because you're from the nasty natty, bro. I know how people get down there. You yeah, know what I'm saying? yeah. And it's like it even even so, you know, childhood trauma, family trauma teaches you not to open up. But you're like, you know what? Me not opening up has not been working for me. You know what I'm saying? So what was that that point? You was like, you know what? Let's give it a shot. So and, and I don't I don't say this much. I mean, this happened years ago, but. I think um, like five years ago, I got I got assaulted, you know, and I know you remember it, you know, and I appreciate you being around there for me. But I think what it did, it it started to. The people that were around me and I'm not saying anybody is bad, I will never throw anybody in the bus, but I think the group that was around me was the group that needed to be around me. And it was very embarrassing during that time. And I think the people that I was around, they made me feel okay. And when, you, and when people make you feel okay, you're able to drop your guard. And so I think my second small group, and I was praying on it, I actually told them my story and I expressed it. And I'm gonna tell you, I broke down and I cried and I'm talking about big cry. Yeah. It's not one of those, you know, you had a funeral and then a tear go down and you hurry up and wipe it. Yeah, you get it out of there. <laughs> It was like the I need me I need a few tissues because I'm crying heavily, mm-hmm. and I cried and so I sat there and I was like man I can't believe you know I just opened up to them and we weren't even we weren't even there with our relationship. Yeah. I think from then on, everybody started sharing their story and they and I'm gonna tell you the stories were more traumatic than mine. Oh and yeah! Like, oh my gosh! Yeah, and so. I think we want to open up to each other. We just don't know how. I think with technology, I'm going to go back to the technology. I mean, you can send people emo- you can send people like 10 emojis, and that's a whole sentence. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that conversation has it slowly but surely started to leave, especially with our younger generation, and they're not really having the time to talk. And so after we all shared our stories, we felt we knew each other on a different level. And I think that's where the trust came in. And so, And then letting people know that, we're not, we're no better than each other. We all go through things. Mm-hmm. You know, you feel alone when you go through something as traumatic as what I went through. And I'll be honest, I did feel alone, but I appreciated the small group of people that stayed there uh, with me. And it wasn't even them, you know, just talking to me. The fact that I can call you and we can talk and we could just pick up where, you know, we left off. And I mean, that, that really felt comforting. So. Damn, damn. Before we get out of here, I do see Baby Yoda behind you. I just seen that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, as you know, I have eight questions, eight random questions, and I need you to give me a number between one and eight, okay? And I want you to answer the question as honestly and as thorough, and you can open up if you want to, and I need you to tie a message to it as well. So give me a number from one to eight. If it's a question that has already been used, I'm going to switch it to another one. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and use, uh, got to go with number one. Number one. Okay. All right. And this is a great question for you. Y'all be, it's like y'all ask the right ones specifically that'll be good for you. <laughs> so so here, here's the one for you. What life skills do you have that would be conducive to a community pre 1600s? Hmm. 
I would say my my interpersonal skills. I really know how to relate to people um, and to anybody. I mean, I can hold a conversation with anybody. And so, I, you know, I'll give you a story. So when I graduated, you know, from college, my first job out of college, I was a community organizer. Oh, yeah. So I flew down to it was a it was a faith based organization. Flew down to West Palm Beach. We trained and the whole goal was to work with congregations, all, you know, different uh, religions in the community and just bring about social justice, um, help write grants for the community. And so um, I was nervous. So I, my first job was in Dayton and I lived in a seminary in Dayton View. So if you're mm. familiar with Dayton. And so, I mean, I work probably 80 hours a week, but I think what was most intriguing is the fact that God was putting me out of my comfort zone because I had to talk to anybody and everybody. I was going to, I think I was going to maybe 10 to 15 churches a day, Damn. just sitting around and just talking to the congregation. I would have to go to service. And I, I mean, you talk about sweating. I think I needed to change my shirts <laughs> every day. But I think what it taught, it taught me to do was that we're all the same people and you just have to show people that you have an interest in what they believe in and being able to connect with them. And I think I, I did a great job at just connecting with people. And I can, I mean, I had, I had a young lady um, at, it was um, uh, the Omega church in Dayton. I um, met her and then we went out for coffee and she just appreciated just what I said. And she gave me her life story. This woman has 10 kids, no help, wow. you know, just, just going through and I just pray for her. And I mean, it was just, it, it was just a beautiful thing this, that she looked at me. And to this day, we still talk mm -hmm. to this day. And so that's probably close to 20 years later that I, I grabbed on, I grabbed something. She grabbed something from me. And so I, I think I do a good job at connecting with people. I mean, I have, if you look at my friend group, I got, I got friends from a little bit of all walks of life. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I, I believe that's what, you know, Jesus is teaching us to do. I mean, you don't have to be around like-minded people. Don't, don't, you know, you don't have to share the same views I share. And so I do a good job at that. Damn. So you would definitely be on the King's council. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> Hey, I, I drink and I know things. That's what they say. So, yeah. so Kareem, brother, I appreciate you. Tell the people where they can find you. So I got I wear many hats. You know, yeah. I work. I'm a you know I'm a realtor. So you can find me on IG at Kareem the Realtor, um, or my name Kareem Todd on Facebook. Um, I'd be glad to answer your questions. But James, brother, I enjoyed this. I had a great time. And if I imparted any knowledge on anybody, you know, uh, you know, that's great. Yeah, you already know you did. And you, you, you got to spell Kareem for him because you spell it. Oh, yeah. Kareem. K-A-R-I-M. Not E-E-I-M. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so I get that a lot. And then the fact that I got two first names, man. So that's another um, ongoing joke. But it's all good, man. Hey, appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate you.